Hey everybody, please stay tuned after the reaction. We are going to share with you a very special P.O. Box gift that we've received. On with the show. Natasha. Debbie. Show. The show. <laughs> Welcome to it. <laughs> Just two patriotic girls. Learning about the world. So please, don't take us the wrong way. <laughs> Welcome to the Natasha and Debbie show. Wow, my mouth could not keep up with my brain. I know, you were going so fast. <laughs> Hi. Um, yep, that happened. Um, if you guys like our show, our content, us as human beings, um, we'd appreciate it if you'd hit that like button. It takes a half a second. Time yourself. And also consider subscribing to our channel. It's free. <laughs> it's absolutely free. So uh, last summer... Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of stuff was going on with Oppenheimer movie, uh, a lot about the new, the atomic bomb. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to find a video so that we could cover that on here. And I came across this video, which sounded a little bit more intriguing because um, I don't know anything about it. Much more interesting. What do you got for us, Debbie? Because it I'm is excited. called the biggest non-nuclear bomb in World War II used by the RAF. I haven't heard about this. I never heard about this hence the interest I have in hearing about this mm -hmm. and learning about this. I definitely need to get more information, and hopefully you do too. And yeah. You can learn along with us. And, and first and foremost, if there are any active duty uh, military and or veterans watching this, um, please, please, please accept this. Thank you Thank for your you. service. Um, we always mean that, and it's never mm -hmm. just said as words that mean nothing. There's always meaning behind that. Please hear that. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you found this one because I don't remember learning about this in school. Mm -mm. Doesn't mean they didn't teach it. Exactly. It was a long time ago, and I just can't remember everything. 500 years ago. Taught us. BC. It wasn't that long ago, because I'm not that old. Okay, now I feel bad. <laughs> um, but anyway, yeah, so I have a strong interest in hearing this and uh, learning about this uh, this bomb. And again, in the comments, we'll rely on you guys, too, if there's something maybe we don't know that wasn't... It's a shorter video. Mm -hmm. um, let us know. Extra information. But yeah, I, this is not something I, I have any knowledge on. So mm -hmm. good job finding this one. Thank you. Yeah. And don't forget to stay tuned with us. We have Ooh. a special P.O. box to share with you after the reaction. Absolutely. So let's get on with it. Um, I'm really interested to hear about this. The biggest non-nuclear bomb World War II used by the RAF. In March of 1945, 15 specially modified Avro Lancaster bombers of 617 Squadron oh, wow. were on their way to a strategic target in western Germany. The Allies have been attempting to demolish the Bielefeld viaduct using thousands of bombs since the beginning of the war, really? but with no success. Wow. This time, however, the 15 Lancasters were carrying just a single bomb each, each one capable of destroying the very foundations of the target one of which was a bomb that the world had never seen used before. The Grand Slam. The Grand Slam. Mm. During World name. War II, like the main weapon used by RAF Bomber Command was the General Purpose Bomb. Now, as the name suggests, this weapon attempted to satisfy a range of requirements and came in a variety of weights and explosive yields. But it did have significant limitations. The general purpose bomb used a thick walled metal casing with an explosive filler and the earlier British versions had a charge to weight ratio of around 27%. That is to say only 27% of the whole weight of the bomb is actually explosive. Interesting. Now as a comparison the Germans were using general purpose bombs that had a charge to weight ratio of around oh, wow. 50%. The like British response to this was to upgrade their bombs to medium capacity bombs. This improved the charge to weight ratio up to at least 40%. And coupled with a new filler with more explosive power, it was a marked improvement. Another limitation, and perhaps more significant, was that general purpose bombs are designed to explode either at or near the surface and destroy their target directly by explosive force. Mm -hmm. The most assured way to achieve destruction of the target is a direct hit. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Sometimes when we do military videos and stuff like this, people will get a little upset with us and they think because we love the military that we love war. And I just want to take a moment and say how much we hate war. 
Exactly. So I actually get a little uncomfortable. I and mean, I'm right now, I'm a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. hearing about, you know, the target and destroying things. You know, I don't like that. Right. Because, you know, some of those things are people. Yeah. And, and we do think that into account. And we a do, lot of times. Yeah. We definitely think of that. Yeah. So we're not warmongers. You can love mm -hmm. your military and respect them and honor them and appreciate them without loving war. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, it is interesting to learn about this mm -hmm. and understand how these things work. And I just wanted to say that. So destruction of the target is a direct hit. Unfortunately, bomb aim and technology at the time was poor, and therefore wow, so was accuracy. Lot. And so to improve a bombing raid's chance of success, Bomber Command used area bombardment, dropping large numbers of bombs over a wide area in the hope that the target would be hit. This obviously had the disadvantage of requiring large numbers of aircraft carrying large numbers so of ordnance misses they get. and mm -hmm. the inevitable collateral damage, including terrible civilian death numbers. See? Exactly. See? That's what we're talking there about. There was also a limitation that due to the shortcomings of the general purpose bomb, it was quite easy to fortify critical installations using thick concrete walls. Hmm. A possible solution to this problem had been undergoing investigation since the start <laughs> of the war by the English engineer and inventor Barnes Wallace. He had a theory that an exceptionally large, very heavy bomb, highly aerodynamic to achieve high speed and with delayed detonation, would be able to cause the destruction of a target through shockwaves being transmitted through the ground. See, now this is cool. I like learning about how things work, how things are built, how, mm -hmm. they, how they serve a purpose. The science behind it. Is fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And this is too. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of looking at this like, okay, this is really quite cool. And hearing how they they solve a problem and make something mm -hmm. better, you know, it's exactly it's still really interesting. This theoretical <coughs> bomb gained the nickname the earthquake bomb. His idea Jeez. was to build a bomb ten tons in weight with a hard armored tip, and to drop it from a height of forty thousand feet. Okay. The speed it would achieve in freefall, he hoped, would be almost supersonic, and would have the effect of a ten-ton wow. artillery shell being fired straight down into the ground. A delayed action fuse would allow sufficient time for the bomb to penetrate deep underground, and the explosion would cause a shockwave equivalent to that of a 3.6 magnitude earthquake. Wow. Oh, I knew that's where he was going. The at. explosion would not need to breach the surface, Jeez. as the shockwaves would create a cavern underground, yeah, which like would then collapse, removing the foundations of structures or buildings on the surface. Mm. The Huge. need for a direct hit on a target is huh. therefore no longer required, as just being close by to targets such as dams, railways, viaducts, and even reinforced buildings okay. would cause considerable damage That's or even complete mm. destruction. As there was no aircraft available to carry such a bomb to such a height, mm. Wallace even designed a heavy lift high altitude bomber specifically really? for the job, the six engined Victory Bomber. Wow. Know that. Sadly for Wallace, these ideas didn't gain a lot of traction from the military decision makers at the Not time. Surprised. And so Wallace switched his attention to another radical concept, the bouncing bomb. The success of Operation Chastise on the 16th and 17th of May 1943 had shown that not only had Wallace been successful with his innovative designs, but also that the RAF now had a very capable heavy bomber in the Avro Lancaster. They now actively encouraged Wallace to revisit his earthquake bomb, although no contracts okay. were signed until they had been proven to work. Well, good call. The first design for his earthquake bombs was called Tallboy. It had a mass of approximately 12,000 pounds, a length of 21 feet, and a diameter of 38 inches. To that's prevent a, the bomb breaking huge. apart on impact, it was cast in one piece of high tensile steel. Jeez. And it was shaped to be as aerodynamically clean as possible to allow it to reach a much <coughs> higher terminal velocity than that of traditional bombs. The fins attached to the case enabled it to spin as it fell, giving it much greater stability and prevent tumbling and therefore enhance its accuracy. It was designed to be. You were gonna pause it, and then I was like, I'm gonna go ahead. I'm picturing like a screw, like a screwdriver, like kind of being uh -huh. and into the ground. Yeah. What they were saying earlier about the other thing. I, I'm just thinking about how fascinating it is that all these things are designed and all the engineering and science that goes behind it and mm -hmm. just the technology that's come mm -hmm. along and the way things have advanced. It's quite incredible. It is. The way things have, the things that they've come up with. I agree. Oh, here. There you go. Thank you. And tumbling and therefore enhance its accuracy. It was designed to be released from 18,000 feet and a forward speed of 170, 170. miles per hour. 
These release figures would mean it would impact the ground at 750 miles Whoa. per hour, with enough energy to make a crater 80 foot deep I'd and 100 say. feet across, Jeez. and also penetrate concrete up to 16 feet thick. Are you kidding? The bomb was packed with an explosive called Torpex that was 50% more powerful than TNT by mass and had only been in use since 1942. Wow. It had to be melted and then poured by hand into the bomb casing. Oh, wow. After filling, a one inch layer of pure TNT was poured over the top of the Torpex before sealing with a composite wax. The precision wow. manufacturing process meant that these bombs were incredibly expensive and so were only to be yeah, used against high so. value targets where mm -hmm. no other option was viable. And air crews were also instructed that all unused bombs be returned to base rather than jettisoned at sea. Due to the heavy weight of the tall boy, <coughs> as well as the high release altitude, the Avro Lancasters needed alterations. Hmm, to that? save weight, hmm. they had armor plating removed, as well as some defensive armaments. The Bombay doors also had to be modified to accommodate such an enormous so payload. Yeah, bigger, right? The first use yeah. of the tall boy took place on the night of the 8th of June, 1944. Okay. Two days Where? earlier, Allied forces had stormed the beaches of Normandy as part okay. of the D-Day landings. Intelligence revealed that a German Panzer division was heading west to engage the Allied invaders. They were traveling by rail and were expected to use a railway crossing over the Loire River uh, as well as a see. railway tunnel. Shortly before 11 p.m. on the 8th of June 1944, 25 Lancasters of 617 Squadron successfully got airborne from RAF Woodhall Spa and okay. headed for Saumur. Western France. Such was the hasty nature of this raid, three Lancasters could not get loaded in time and so didn't take part. Mm. Of the 25 Lancasters, six were carrying eight 1,000 pound general purpose bombs. Okay. 19 okay. were carrying tall boys. To help with accuracy, more? three de Havilland Mosquito aircraft of 83 Squadron Pathfinder Force were at the head of the flight. Those are at cool. approximately 2 a.m., they, they were over the target and launched flares to assist the arriving Lancaster bomb aimers. Okay. And all the bombers released their tall boys successfully. Several direct hits all were 19? reported, causing the railway line and the bridge Jeez. to be destroyed. One tall boy actually bored his way through the hillside and exploded in the railway tunnel, wow. which was 60 feet below the surface. Are you kidding? Wow. You can definitely see where bombs like this were kind of a need to fight the war, to block off those, yeah, those railroad stations and, yeah. and the bridges because none of the other bombs were doing it's it. Six, so wow. it's, it's quite incredible. It is. What was those numbers again he just said? Hillside and exploded in the railway tunnel, which was 60 feet below the surface. That's crazy. Causing a complete blockage. All of the aircraft returned safely to base. The tall boy was a complete success and would continue to be used <coughs> for the remainder of the war against notable targets such as V-2 rocket assembly bunkers and the Bismarck-class battleship okay. Turpids. Mm -hmm. Now whilst all of this was a vindication of Wallace's designs, he was still thinking of his original concept of a 10-ton earthquake bomb and work was well underway to build this larger version of the tall boy. It was essentially identical to the tall boy just on a bigger scale yeah. and called yeah. Grand Slam. Grand Slam. It had a mass of 22,000 pounds, a length of 26 feet 6 inches, and with an added tail length of 13 That's feet 6 monster. inches. And a mm. diameter of 3 foot 10 inches. That's a monster. With a charge to weight ratio of 50%, oh, wow. it had a blast yield equivalent to 6.5 tons of TNT. Oh crap. Wow. Making it Sorry. by far <laughs> the most powerful non-nuclear weapon used in World War yeah. II. Yes it, yes, it was. And just like its smaller sibling, it was filled with molten Torpex. And such was the quantity required, it would take a whole month before it was set. The long, Jeez. complex manufacturing process, as well oh, as its exactly. cost, meant that, just like the tall boy, an undelivered bomb would have to be returned to base, rather than jettisoned at sea. How much did those cost? As a result, crews were instructed to divert to RAF Carnaby in East Yorkshire to make use of the longer runway. It was still intended to be dropped from 40,000 feet, but, mighty as the Avro Lancaster was proving itself to be, this was Can't still unachievable. I thought. It would have to be dropped from altitudes typically around 15,000 feet. So, and even then, the Lancaster would have to be modified substantially. Mm. 32 Lancaster B-1 Specials were built and supplied to 617 Squadron. They were fitted with upgraded Merlin 24 engines with paddle propellers, which gave mm -hmm. more power. Those are cool the removal of the front and mid-upper gun turrets removed weight. It yeah, also okay. improved the aerodynamics. That makes sense. And whereas for the tall boy, the Bombay doors were adapted, 
For Grand Slam, they were removed completely. Uh -huh. I was wondering. Also, the undercarriage had to be strengthened to allow for the added weight, should the mm. bomber have to land with an undelivered weapon. Oh, the yeah. first B-1 special aircraft arrived on the 5th of March, and 617 Squadron's Canadian commander, Group Captain Johnny Falkier, had a Grand Slam loaded on board, and he took it for a test flight to check Jeez. the Lancaster's handling. That'd be so he scary. Recalled yeah. that he was becoming mm -hmm. concerned during the takeoff roll. He hey, would you like to test flight this non-nuclear bomb that's like... I know. Called no. the earthquake bomb? Yeah, the Grand no, Slam? <laughs> would you? And you have to come back and land with this thing attached to the bottom of your car. <laughs> no, I, I couldn't do it. Mm. No. Kind of scary. Nope. Those, yeah, nope. Nope. Brave, brave soldiers. Yep. He would normally be airborne at 110 <clears throat> miles per hour, but he was still stuck to the ground at 145 miles per hour. Finally, wow. though, and with the wings bending up at a startling angle, the aircraft left the ground. Wow. And following a 20 minute flight, he landed safely and Nurse. declared the Lancaster safe to carry the Grand Slam. Safely. On safely. the morning of the 13th of March, right. the Grand Slam was dropped for the first time over the RAF bombing range at Ashley Walk in Hampshire. It left a crater 30 feet deep with a diameter of 124 feet. Jeez. The test drop was a success. Later that same day, look two Grand Slams were prepared with 11 second fuses. Say, be, One look was at that. Group Captain Faye, Two grand Look at that. That's a beast. It's like attaching a huge truck. I was going to say a mini submarine. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me. It looks like a mini mm -hmm. sub. Um, no way. That's huge. There's just I could not handle the the this like the anxiety oh, of being yeah. in any one of those those uh those uh planes and having something like that as my cargo. Mm -hmm. Um, couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. No way. I mean, there's just too many things that could have gone wrong. But, um, <clears throat> yep, nope. Um, but that thing looks like a mini submarine. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's much more accurate than my truck. Submarine's much more fitting. Whoa. Incredible. Sorry, I just had to stop and take a look at that for a moment because that's just a beast. Grand Slams were prepared with 11 <clears throat> second fuses. One was loaded on the Captain second... Falkier's aircraft and the other to that of squadron leader Charles Calder. The RAF had a target in mind. Yeah. Did it. Since the beginning of the war, oh, was this the again? Bielefeld okay. Viaduct in Western Germany, which carried the strategically important Ham Minden railway line, had been subjected to several attacks and over three and a half thousand tons of bombs had been dropped. Jeez. Although regularly being damaged, it had stubbornly refused to fall. Now, two Grand Slams oh, it's going down, away, I have a feeling. along with 18 other <clears throat> Lancasters carrying tall boys. Wow. wow. However, frustratingly, the raid had to be aborted due Whoa. to cloud obscuring the target. Oh, uh, okay. So the next day, the 14th of March, 1945, 16 Lancasters would try again. Two Lancaster, Group Captain Falkier and Squad Leader Calder, were armed with Grand Slams. Okay. The remaining 14 with Tall Boys. All During once start the bridge, huh? Falkier's mm -hmm. Lancaster developed an engine fault and had to be withdrawn, leaving Squad Leader Calder to deliver the single Grand Slam. I'm sorry, but that almost just sounds like a movie plot, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> it's like, oh, nope, just got one chance now. Yep. That's just interesting. I'm like, didn't see that coming. I'm like, oh, come on. Mm -hmm. I'm already anxious enough about this. <laughs> and then just like draw it out to, all right. Okay. Sorry. Leaving Squadron Leader Calder to deliver the single Grand Slam. Hmm. Like previous Tall Boy missions, the target was to be marked by four de Havilland mosquitoes of the Pathfinder Force. Okay. And there was also a mosquito of 627 Squadron to film the attack. Hmm. Shortly after 1.30pm, 15 Lancasters roared into the sky from RAF Woodhall Spa in Lincolnshire and okay. headed east, accompanied by an escort of P-51 Mustangs. And by 4.30pm, the squadron was over the target. Squadron leader Calder's aircraft came in from the south and released the Grand Slam from a height of 12,000 feet. Ooh, that's a little low. As the bomb departed the bomb bay, the Lancaster lurched upwards when free of the enormous weight. I bet it did. The Grand Slam, now accelerating towards its terminal velocity, was right on target for the viaduct. Spotters in other aircraft and the filming Mosquito reported that the Grand Slam impacted the ground approximately 100 feet to the side of the viaduct. 11 seconds later, with tall boys detonating all around it, the Grand Slam exploded. Knew it. It was hard to distinguish footage? which damage was caused by Tall Boys and which by the Grand Slam. Oh, good question. But it is true to say that alongside where the Grand Slam hit, a 260 feet span of the viaduct was demolished. Oh, I would say Later, the reconnaissance Grand Slam. photos also showed that at the north end of the viaduct, another 200 foot span was destroyed. 
Oh really? Mm. The mission was a complete wow. success and all aircraft returned to base safely. During the remainder of March 1945, a further 156 day sorties were flown, <coughs> comprising of 40 tall boys and 31 Grand Slams. By the end of the war, 41 Grand Slam bombs had been dropped. Bomber really? Command Chief Arthur Harris was suitably impressed by Barnes Wallace's invention, mm -hmm. and he had been drawn up several plans to use it to attack heavily fortified targets before victory in Europe was declared on Tuesday, the 8th of May, 1945. Well, that was uh, tense, intense, and um, intense. <laughs> yeah, that was. Um, dang, man, that thing was a beast. I'm seriously sticking with it. That was a mini submarine. That was <laughs> that was a that was a beast. It definitely was a beast, and it Oof. definitely did its job. And it's nice. It was good to see that. It didn't that kill the, people. It at wasn't least in that regard, necessarily right? used for killing people at that time. Um, and it was good to see that. The government, the, the military was starting to use that in the way that it was going to be beneficial to win the war. But luckily, they didn't need to. Yeah, true. Um, what happened with those, though? Were they continued to be used for other things later on? Um, mm. I would like to know that. That did not, unfortunately, tell us that in the video. And I'd be curious, to, did it get retired? Um, mm -hmm. As most things tend to do. Um, but uh <clears throat> If you guys like this episode, please hit the like button, consider subscribing to the channel. And again, leave us a comment with more information that you might have um, to let us know about some of this. I was surprised when he said that they flew from Lincolnshire. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know much about Lincolnshire. Um, we have a couple friends from there, but I'm not sure about the military bases or whatnot in that area. Hmm, maybe that's something um, we could look at more. Yeah. I'm, military bases. Within. Yeah. Because I'm used to hearing Yorkshire a lot, you know, so that yep. kind of threw me off. I was like, oh, okay. Um, but yeah, that was a good, good find. I thought it was fascinating. Um, to, to hear that and learn about it a little bit, but to have man, a bomb that's going to cause basically an earth, earthquake, was, yeah. you know, and shatter everything around it. I mean, I, mean, I, I think they incredible. should have called it what I was saying, the mini submarine, because it's like mm -hmm. essentially going under the ground. It truly you know? was. Hey. <laughs> saying mini sub submarine bomb. At the beginning of the video, um, we let you guys know that we have a special peel box gift to share with you today. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, um, well, it's fitting for this video. So, firstly and foremost, um, uh, do you want me to read it? you want to read it? Uh, whichever I, okay. I... Go ahead, since you have it. So, it's actually sent by an ex-Royal Air Force uh, member, and uh, that is awesome. So, mm -hmm. come on, that's why we had to bring it out for this video. And we've only had it for a short time, so... Came in this wonderful package. Now, a lot of you saw that we got, on a live video we did it, we received mm -hmm. uh, Ceramic Poppy from the Tower of London, the commemoration that was done. And I cried like a little baby. Yes, and that was such an honor to receive And that. still incredibly an honor and still so appreciated. So we get this too, and it shows, you know, one soldier and says there but not forgotten. So when you open this, you notice how the camera gets darker whenever I hold anything up there. Mm. Um, this is pretty special. So I think I'll hand that to you first, and I'll go ahead and read the letter, and then we'll show you exactly what it is. Maybe some of you know what it is says, hi there, Natasha and Debbie. This is from Bill Watson. Um, he's in Scotland, actually. I've been following your channel for a couple of years now. Great content. Thank you, sir. I love the way you adore the military. I myself am ex-Royal Air Force. And thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Uh, recently, I watched the episode where you received the Tower of London Poppy, and I thought I would send this to you. <laughs> I know he is a Tommy, but you Americans lost people in both world wars as well. Tommy was designed to commemorate the end of the First World War, and I would like you to accept this gift from the UK and an ex-serviceman. Already. Mm -hmm. Put him on the shelf beside your beloved puppy dogs, and think of all the lost servicemen when you look at him. I'm not going to cry on this video. I have one, and think of an uncle we lost in a ship sinking in the Mediterranean in 1942. Enjoy him and keep him. All the best, Bill Watson. Well, Bill, thank you. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Bill. Thank you, thank you. Um, there's a card. Do you want to open it and show them? Sure, I'll go ahead and open it up here. This is so, like, beautiful. He's kind, kind of, of hard to see. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> to show. Let's take him out. And we were going to put it on the shelf behind us. We tried. But you can't even see it in the video. See, it's this weird. Yeah, you can't see him. He's, he's you, you see through him, unfortunately. So, <clears throat> we actually have him over here on our bookshelf that's black. And that's where we've been keeping him. Mm -hmm. We just put him back in the box to show you guys. But it's got a stand too. 
And then on the inside, it talks about how your tummy has been created by veterans. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got a frog in my throat all day today. Your tummy has been created by veterans who work for Royal British Legion Industries and profits raised will be donated to charities which help us deliver our aims, including the following goes on and tells you. Um, and uh, so this comes with, this is the like, really cool thing too. It comes with this card, which says from your soldier boy, Remembrance. This is like so hard for me. I'm like gonna try really hard not to cry. <laughs> when you open it up, there's a picture of a, of a gentleman here. And um, it's like the copy of a card on this side, which says, my heart is with you in my thoughts every day. From Jim to Nell, October 1917. And then it says, on this side, this is Jim. He sent this beautiful card to Nell over 100 years ago in October 1917 during World War I. Wow. We don't know if Jim made it home or ever saw Nell again. Hey there. Mm. The Commonwealth War Graves Foundation commemorates the 1.7 million men and women like Jim who fought and died during both world wars. We want to ensure that their stories are never forgotten. Here's Jim. We are not going to forget you, Jim. No. And so, yeah, it's um, a beautiful sentiment, a beautiful thing to receive um, that we will not forget. He's going back on the shelf. <laughs> I wish we could. He really can't. See. I know. That's why I was leaving it in the box. I can see why he did. Disappears. I have me wearing black. There you go. <laughs> yes, I take my microphone to my shirt. <laughs> Secrets <laughs> out. Um, but you really can't see him on the shelf, unfortunately. No. Um, that sucks. We tried. Um, but this is absolutely beautiful and, and special and mm -hmm. we appreciate it so much. And thank you for even thinking of us. It is. Thank um, you for sending it to us. It's, it means it's definitely on our shelf. We have been looking at it. Yeah. It's out right where we walk by it every single day. Mm -hmm. I look at him every time I come in the office actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, we just wanted to share that with you on this, especially this episode. And thank you again to Bill. Um, for sending that to us. Uh, we really, really, really appreciate it. So thank you guys for joining us today. Hopefully you learned something with us. Until the next time, guys, please love like jazz. Be as strong as Tyson. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.